from chamber for executive committee. Okay, everyone, would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call of uh, committee members. Council Salvador. Good afternoon. Councilor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councilor Jans. Councilor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, let me see if there are any other colleagues joining us. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Cardinal. Good afternoon. Thank you. All right, we are on to item 7.1, bylaw 20678 to implement clean energy improvement program. Any Administration is coming down. While you're doing that, I would also like to add additional speaker on 7.2, John Larkon, Mill Thistle Farm, joining us remotely. Okay. We need to vote on that? Yes, you yeah, need to vote be, on that at committee. Could committee vote on that, please? I mean, yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councilor, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now over to administration. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, my name is Kent Snyder. I'm the Branch Manager of Planning and Environment Services, and we're excited to be here today to provide Executive Committee an update on the Clean Energy Improvement Pilot Program and present the bylaw for the permanent program. The Community Energy Transition Strategy is Edmonton's plan to transition to a low carbon city by 2050. The strategy has five critical pathways for climate action, one of which is an emission neutral building pathway. This pathway calls for a massive energy efficiency retrofit effort that would support the creation of a thriving retrofit industry. Next slide please. Our communities are experiencing the effects of a changing climate. The city continues to increase its efforts to reduce the impact of climate change and has set bold and ambitious climate targets and we're taking action to achieve them. Connect Edmonton's goal of climate resilience outlines a transition to a low carbon future. Council approved strategies that support this goal include the city plan and the community, community energy transition strategy. Both of these will help shape Edmonton's future economy and the way our city is built. Next slide please. So how do we get there? Buildings are crucial to meeting our climate targets as they make up 39% of Edmonton's emissions and their energy efficiency directly impacts costs and comfort of those living in the homes. For a typical two-income owner-occupied household in Edmonton, 
the share of an average monthly household spending in 2019 on shelter, including mortgage payments, condo fees, and utilities, such as heating and cooling their homes, was estimated to be approximately 18%. Increasing energy costs will pose a growing challenge and rising interest rates can make paying for the retrofits needed more challenging. I'll now turn the presentation over to Barbara Daly for more information on how the Clean Energy Improvement Program can help address these challenges. Good afternoon. The Clean Energy Improvement Program supports residential and commercial property owners in their energy transition goals. It is a financing tool that supports energy efficiency and renewable energy upgrade investment on privately owned buildings. This program supports building owners making improvements that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. CIP assists with upfront costs of up to 100%. CIP provides property owners access to long-term financing to make eligible upgrades to their properties. The repayment term is set by the expected useful life of each upgrade. Financing is repaid by the property owner through property taxes. This mechanism allows the repayment obligation to be transferred to the next owner, similar to a local improvement charge for sidewalks or street lighting. Next slide, please. On August 19, 2021, City Council passed the CIP tax bylaw, which enabled the City to develop and launch the pilot program. The CIP pilot opened March 2022 for residential properties and filled quickly. In June 2022, a stream for commercial properties was opened. The pilot will continue through 2024, with many projects currently in the middle of their retrofits. It is expected to be wrapped up later in 2024. Next slide, please. The residential stream had an overwhelming response, exceeding the original target number the first day. There are currently 95 approved residential files. The total projected retrofit value is forecast at $3.36 million. The most common residential upgrades have been of the 95, 71 in, uh, for windows, 62 for insulation, 44 air ceiling, and 42 projects chose solar PV. The average residential project financing is just over $35,000. For commercial, there are four active projects with a total projected value of $3.1 million. 21 projects in the pilot have completed all their chosen retrofits, so the pilot has another 78 files that continue to require resources through 2024 to bring those to completion. Next slide, please. One of the commercial projects has completed retrofits. High Tech Seals is a commercial building in South Edmonton that access, uh, accessed $1 million in CIP financing. They installed solar PV, insulation, and an electric storage water heater. These retrofits complemented existing technologies in the building, including geothermal, which had been installed 10 years earlier. The benefits of a net zero building may include reduced utility costs, improved comfort with more stable temperatures, reduced noise, and improved property value. Projects like this move us toward our goal of a low carbon Edmonton by 2050. We expect, and we expect to have an additional six net zero residential properties by the end of this pilot. Next slide, please. There are the next steps for the program if approved. The bylaw attached to this report will be required to establish a permanent CIP in Edmonton. The anticipated cost is $5.8 million for project implementation and operation over four years. Financing plan for the permanent program is $20 million over these four years from 2024 to 2027. As per the CIP regulation, this amount will not impact the city's debt limit. The source of financing for the scaled program will be the use of funds from Edmonton's short-term investments, such as the money market or short-term bond funds during 2024. Longer-term solutions are being explored through FCM and various banking institutions. The province does not loan to municipalities for a CIT program, and therefore the city cannot use this traditional borrowing mechanism to finance the program. Administration is also working on a master program agreement with a program administrator that will finalize costs. Next slide, please. From the completed project so far, buildings have seen significant reduction in energy use and corresponding GHGs. The $20 million in financing would support an estimated 300 residential and 16 commercial projects and see more buildings reach significant reductions. The program leads to a more energy efficient property in the short term. A feature of the repayment design is the option of transferability of the CIP tax if the property is sold. The economic benefits are realized through local businesses performing the retrofits and gaining experience in energy efficient upgrades and technologies. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, if the first reading of the bylaw is approved, administration must advertise the bylaw for 60 days prior to having City Council consider it for a second and third reading. 
If passed, administration would finalize a master program agreement with Alberta municipalities. Administration would then be ready to launch in late spring. The CIP team will continue to engage with pilot applicants who complete their projects through 2024. Their feedback is used to inform continued enhancement of the permanent program. Administration will also participate in research on how programs like CIP can be applied to new home construction with findings expected in Q3 2024. Retrofitting energy efficient buildings not only stimulates economic activity, but it may also foster innovation in the green building sector. The benefit of innovative solutions like CIP help strengthen Edmonton's local economy, protect the environment, and move toward a low carbon future. Next slide, please. Thank you. We would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the presentation as well as for waiting through the uh, morning. And this time we will go to members of the public who are here to make presentations on this. Uh, I will call up on you to please step up to the uh, to the chairs, uh, Dave Turnbull, Canadian Home Builders Association, Edmonton Region in person, uh, as well as uh, uh, Stephanie Drozda, Alberta Eco Trust Foundation in person. Oh, you want to? You want? You can sit down if, on the chair if you want to. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, and uh, when the green light is lit, that means your five minutes are starting. Yellow means you have one minute remaining, and that means your five minutes are, uh, uh, are over. And after that, committee members or council members may have questions to you. Yeah. And we will hear you in panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Turnbull. Uh, I'm the president and lead energy analyst with Interspec Consulting. Uh, I'm here today representing the Canadian Home Builders Association. Um, our association represents over 400 member companies involved in home building across the Metro Edmonton area, from excavation to pouring a foundation all the way to finishing touches like plumbing fixtures and countertops. Over the past decade, our industry has seen energy consumption become much more important to consumers. An energy efficient home reduces the cost of home ownership and has benefits on the environment. The Clean Energy Improvement Program is a great way to get more people to retrofit their homes by providing access to financing and an incentive to enhance the efficiency of their home, save money, and enhance the value of their asset. Uh, passing this bylaw is even more important with the recent slowing down and ultimately stopping of the Canada Greener Homes Grant Program and there seems to be no other programs on the horizon to take its place. Um, the uh, Clean Energy Improvement Program will help more of the older building stock get retrofits and help the city meet its energy targets and have homeowners enjoy the benefits of lower bills and more comfortable living space. As somebody who's on the front line of energy audits, I can tell you the new home builds are getting more and more efficient every day. However, there is still a long way to go in older homes that were built with different mechanical systems and very outdated construction techniques. Changing out mechanical components for heating, cooling, and providing hot water are expensive. So are solar panels and better windows, and most of the changes that will significantly impact energy use. The funding provided through the Clean Energy Improvement Program will allow homeowners to undertake retrofits to go further than they might otherwise plan to go with. Um, the Canadian Home Builders Association has experienced a huge uptake in our educational events related to greener building approaches and programs like this make access to retrofitting homes easier for homeowners. One criticism, and, and this is just kind of mine if I can take off my CHBA hat for a minute, um, is uh, this program just looking at it, it seems to have um, they, they, there seems to be a, a tendency to want to do a whole lot, like they want to make a big improvement on a home. I think um, we also tend to, when we do that, we tend to leave out some people who may not necessarily be able to afford that big an improvement or the, afford the payments on that large of an improvement. Um, I would challenge and encourage council and admin to look at opportunities to improve the energy use for all income levels. I'm thinking in terms of like a CEIP light where perhaps uh, somebody who had limited means but still had the need to improve something. The example I would use is uh, a furnace. 
Uh, we all have to replace them. They usually don't get replaced when you can afford them. They get replaced when you have to. Um, and what usually happens in these cases is people who can't afford to pay for it, they wind up going into secondary and tertiary lending situations where they're paying 24, 25% interest on, on that kind of an appliance. Um, looking at the legislation, the SEEP is kind of, seems to be capped at about 9%. There's a big difference to the homeowner between paying 25% on, on a project and paying 9% on a project. So I just like to toss that out there. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we at the CHBA support this bylaw and look forward to working with the city on implementing the program as partners in home energy efficiency. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Stephanie Drosta. Good afternoon, Mayor Sohi and members of council. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes of your time. I'm Stephanie Drosta, Program Specialist with the Edmonton Climate Innovation Fund at Alberta Ecotrust Foundation. Alberta Ecotrust deploys funds, programming, and low carbon financing through cli the Climate Innovation Fund to the Edmonton community to assist with the city's climate goals. We are very supportive of the city's next steps in making the Clean Energy Improvement Program a permanent offering for Edmontonians. We also want to applaud the city for their advocacy to update the current provincial regulations to allow more flexibility, including for municipal borrowing and increasing the investment limit for multi-unit buildings. These are important pieces that will allow the program to have a larger impact. Improved access to flexible, low-cost low financing is one barrier to advancing retrofits, and we're excited to working to address more barriers and offering additional support to the industry through our soon-to-launch Retrofit Accelerator program. While we support the cre creation of a permanent SEEP program, we would suggest evaluating if the proposed capital amount will meet the magnitude of scale needed. The initial estimates for a permanent program brought forward to Council in September 2022 suggest that 20 to $75 million a year would be needed to support 500 to 1,800 residential projects or 20 to 150 non-residential or a combination of both. Based on a study we conducted on green home loans, it was estimated that approximately 500 home owners a year could seek out a specialized financing to tool such as SEEP. With the current proposal of 20 million over three years, supporting 300 residential and 16 commercial projects, uh, the city could look to increase the available capital as soon as possible, in addition to considering all other options to get us to the scale needed to decarbonize Edmonton's building stock in alignment with the goals outlined in the energy transition strategy. Modeling conducted in support of that plan suggests that over 400,000 residential units and over 11 million square feet of commercial space needs to be retrofitted to a near net zero standard by 2050. Accessible innovative financing may be a nudge for some, but additional support will be critical to address all barriers. These support measures are often categorized under an umbrella term called retrofit accelerator services. This approach focuses on the customer journey with deep energy retrofits or a net zero building being the end goal. Alberta Ecotrust Foundation is pleased to be offering solutions that will add additional support to developing the retrofit market through our retrofit accelerator program for the multifamily and commercial sectors. We will be focusing on originating and aggregating retrofit opportunities to facilitate access to a variety of funding and financing, not just SEEP. The permanent duration of SEEP is to include coaching services, which is laudable. However, the goal should be to offer these coaching services to all building owners wanting to make upgrades and not just those participating in the program. We know that 80% of residential renovations in Alberta, $50,000 and under, never access any financing. To focus the coaching services on just those that are taking advantage of the financing uh, means that a majority of the renovation market might be missed. Ensuring that appropriate climate programming is available to everyone is important to our organization, and we'd like to encourage that equity and consumer protections are top of mind for, for the city as you look at this program design and other programs. Removing the uh, five-year minimum ownership requirement may open the program to newer homeowners, but without another mechanism to ensure that they have capacity for the additional debt, there is a risk of households taking on more than they might have the means to pay back. As part of the coaching services or seat marketing materials, it should be made clear to anyone participating what the projected debt burden in relation to projected utility cost savings will be. For example, servicing a $50,000 loan amortized over 20 years at 4% interest costs about $300 a month. Achieving a consistent utility savings of $300 per month through retrofits alone could be challenging. Additionally, making a program more accessible um, is not the same as ensuring that 
energy efficiency programming is equitable. So financing programs like SEPA are a great tool for middle to higher income households but are not an ideal solution for lower income households. Continued support for programs like Albert Ecotrust Home Upgrade Program, which is uniquely designed to address energy affordability for lower income households, should be considered. The biggest message that we would like to impart is this. Access to financing is only one of the many barriers to upgrading our building stock in alignment with a low carbon future. We encourage the city to continue to advance all of the tools that will help us achieve an emission neutral building stock, many of which are already outlined as actions in the energy transition strategy. As always, we at the Climate Innovation Fund are delighted to support the city in its climate goals and look forward to continuing to work alongside the city, our communities and industry to realize our low carbon future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll ask uh, if committee members and council members have any questions to uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and uh, sharing your perspectives with us. Um, so just to start, uh, I'll go to Speaker uh, Drozda. Um, you know, one one thing that you mentioned, I, I had flagged on my end. I just want to see if we're, if we're saying the same thing. So uh, when it comes to uh, the initial capitalization of the program, uh, was like your understanding was it was between 20 but also looking up to 75 I think you said um, can you just elaborate on that uh, what what your expectations were or maybe opportunities for for growing that yeah so that was um, in the original I think when the original proposal for the permanent program was brought forward back in September 2022 um, just looking at reaching that capacity of up to 500 maybe even up to 1800 retrofits um, on the residential side. So I guess if that demand does reach that point, uh, 20 million may not be enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I guess, you know, looking looking at the uh, the residential stream filling up in one day for the, the initial pilot, um, what are, I guess, what are you hearing in terms of uh, some of the latent demand and folks wanting to take advantage of this? Do you expect sort of similar uptake, even faster uptake? I think, yeah, that there is demand. Um, the study that we looked at, um, the Green Home Loan study that I mentioned was looking at, um, we had a similar number of about 500 households could be taking um, bespoke energy efficiency uh, retrofit financing, but there would be an opportunity to perhaps look at just the general amenity uh, renovation market, which is quite large. And as, as we mentioned, um, that's a really great opportunity when folks are doing amenity renovations, like putting in a new basement, you wanna be doing energy efficiency measures at that time. Also what Dave was talking about, having that staged approach is also helpful. So um, there is, could be a bigger market to tap into other than folks that are just interested in doing energy efficiency, but they mm -hmm. could that, add that on to other, other costs and amenity renovations. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and uh, maybe just to speak your Turnbull, uh, I guess looking for a little more elaboration on, I think you referred to it as seep light, or, uh, is that, or is that right, sort of a stage, yeah. a stage or phasing yeah, to the program? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, it's the, the with, with the seat program, you know, looking at it, they want to do three, um, at least three up, upgrades and things like that. And I think, you know, if the notion is to take out the carbon, which I think is what we're all looking for here, um, there's, you know, there's a couple of camps when, when you're in the construction industry. There's the guys that want to take it out of the building envelope and people that want to take it out mechanically. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is the environment doesn't care. Um, so one of the one of the fastest ways and most common ways that people do it these days is by changing me out mechanical systems. And when I when I think about homeowners that have a little bit lower income may not necessarily be able to take on the burden of say a twenty or a thirty thousand uh, dollar re major renovation, but they do need a furnace, mm -hmm. and they're running you know, either a mid-efficiency or God forbid, as an energy advisor, we still see hundreds of the old fashioned, uh, atmospherically, uh, naturally aspirating furnaces. They're horrible. They, uh, if you want to improve the efficiency of your home by 25% in an instant, replace that thing. Um, and that also drops the carbon footprint. But a lot of people can't afford that. It's a $7,000 hit. And what usually happens is when they go, f when they go looking at that, um, the Greener Homes Grant Program, there was no funds for that, there was nothing in the Greener Homes Loan. 
Uh, they, they picked electricity as the winner. They did not pick gas in any way, shape, or form. So there's no help on that side, um, at least from the federal, pro from the federal perspective. Um, so, you know, to get people into it, what the, you know, what the furnace installers and those companies do is they have secondary or tertiary financing institutions that'll come by and finance at, you know, 2% per month compounded annually, which comes just under usury. Um, and uh, I would think that, you know, if we had some kind of fund that was available for people within a certain income bracket, not everybody needs that. Some people can access other financing, which is great. But for the people that actually need that kind of financing and are in need of that kind of an upgrade, um, if we had something within the SEAT program that could do that, one is it takes their term out over a longer period of time, which makes the payments a little more affordable. And it also reduces that interest rate substantially, which again, uh, removes some of the burden on the people. Thank you so much for that answer. I have one more question, but I'll uh, come back. No, go ahead, because I, yeah, I had that question that you asked about uh, small uh, homeowners, sure. I'm not homeowners, but sure. small just, appliances. Just go, go ahead. One, yeah. Oh, I see Councillor Wright, though. <laughs> You mentioned the word affordability. So for those um, for those homeowners, yeah, that are at the lower income, then um, I guess maybe saving on their heating bills and whatnot means more to them at that lower income than somebody else who can maybe save energy costs elsewhere with with window replacements and that, right? Yeah, um, and 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 the the thing about that is, you know, it's an instant in that particular scenario. Mm -hmm. That's an instant 25% savings on on that particular utility, right? Um, so it is it is significant, and when you you know, with the ability of seat to to take that over a longer amortization period, your your ability to make sure that you finance that with the energy savings is a lot better. Okay. Yeah. I was and I was you know looking at the the, the federal programs as well. I mean, those are smaller, but yeah, furnaces aren't on there as well as... No, they, no, they picked electricity as the winner. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's, um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Salvador. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I also just wanted to ask uh, Speaker Turnbull about where, just given your experience on CHBA, where new homes can fit into this conversation and maybe future opportunities in that realm as well? Uh, well, where, where new homes would fit into this conversation. Um, it's actually really, really hard for new homes to fit into this conversation. Um, the, the new home industry right now, in my experience, and, and I, a good chunk of our business as a company is in the new home building industry. Uh, we did a fair bit of the existing homes as well with the Greener Homes Grant Program, but I would say the lion's share of our business does lie with the, with the new homes. And what our, our experience has been, you know, the, the new homes have made a marked improvement in terms of energy efficiency over the course of the last number of years. And it wasn't just uh, due to the fact that we had a building code that we had to change. Um, we were building better than what this building code is um, for quite a while because we had to. Uh, we live in a very cold climate. It's a little unforgiving. The wind tends to howl in the winter, and if you're building a leaky home, people are generally not very happy with your product. Um, so the, in the industry has actually been building very well over the course of the number of years. We do have a building code now that, that's going to be coming in this year that's going to kind of give us a chart moving forward. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, I think it has to be measured because there are some aspects. There's some guys just like any other industry. There's some people that are absolute leaders and they're so far ahead of the pack, they, nobody's ever going to catch them. Mm. Uh, and there, there's some people that are straggling that, you know, that's what building code is meant to do, bring them up. Um, so, like, in terms of, in terms of uh, the improvements, again, you're looking at a minimum of five-year home ownership. So people will have to be in that home uh, for at least five years. Statistically, um, new home buyers move about every seven years. So we may not be necessarily capturing that first home buyer, we might be capturing the people with this program that have bought it secondhand mm -hmm. and, are, and are doing that kind of a thing. Yeah. But there is, there will be opportunities as technologies and and, and as um, utility costs, honestly, will drive an awful lot of this, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, no, I appreciate that answer. Um, Stephanie, do you have anything to add on, on that front? 
around uh, the new home piece? Yeah, I think that um, administration did mention that there is a, a study being worked on, um, a, grant pro a grant project that we did fund as part of, part of Alberta Ecotrust that's looking at the role of new um, home and, and SEEP and how they can take advantage of it. If it is just, you know, getting them to that net zero, if it is a new home that's highly efficient, exploring a little bit more to get to net zero, I think there's an opportunity there. So we hope to have, okay. I think, more information later this yeah. year. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, and then just really, last one to just tie up this this uh, line of questioning. Um, when we're talking about sort of lowering those barriers, uh, the potential for, you know, uh, Clean Energy Improvement Program light. Uh, the primary barrier there is the th is it the requirement for at least three upgrades? It would tend to be yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Council Salvador. So thank you so much for the presentation and also waiting uh, uh, for uh, to be part of this. Really appreciate it. And now we'll go to questions to ad from ad administration. Uh, mm -hmm. Councilor Hamilton, are you exempt to this? Yeah, I have no questions. That was just for the speakers. Okay, thank you. Council Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, this is really exciting. Uh, and yeah, I've been, of course, waiting for this for a while and, and so pleased to see that it's finally finally in front of us, such a big step. Um, one of one of the questions that I did, had, or did, did have uh, was mentioned by one of our speakers, just the, um, you know, the, the scale of change that we want to see uh, and then the, the amount in terms of our initial capitalization. I, I was also looking at that September report and, and saw, uh, you know, funding required 21 to 80 million annually um, to provide financing to SEEP applicants. This seems quite, quite, uh, well, it's, it's less <laughs> than what I was expecting to see. Um, so just some thoughts there. Is this a starting place with opportunities for, um, for additional funding? What does that look like? And, and what would that process be um, if we wanted to see a larger capitalization at the outset? Sure, Councillor. I can <clears throat> start with the response and then perhaps the team can, can help. Um, you're absolutely right and what we heard was um, correct in that this is the, the funds required, um, the, the retrofits required is much grander than what you see um, before you at committee. Um, but take this as stepping stones, um, both in terms of the financial package that's wrapped around this and required, um, but also some of the eligibility, um, uh, who it could be, what um, criteria list as we our advocacy moves forward as well um, in terms of this is these are both stepping stones. Um, based on the pilot work that is currently ongoing and we presented a little bit on, we figured that this was the appropriate first stepping stone. Um, that obviously can be adjusted at this point or um, there is a commitment from administration that will keep council apprised of, of progress. And so the intent is not to um, provide any restrictions. If more funds are needed, we would quickly come to council and, and make those requests um, to move forward. We have, um, can offer to come forward um, with an annual report if that's helpful, um, as well as potentially some quarterly memos to council just to, to give comfort um, in terms of progress and where we're sitting financially with the program. But I'll look maybe to the team to add layers on that. Uh, we'll be very interested uh, when, we, when we launch, if this is approved, to just see how briskly the financing is taken up and if it's a mix of commercial, more commercial this time than, than residential and um, keep you apprised and if funds are warranted, we absolutely come back. Okay, um, maybe just some follow-on questions there then. So I trying to gain some greater insight as to the just the proposed commercial versus residential allocation, just given what we learned from the pilot, of course. Um, I mean, I, I visited High Tech Seals and it's fantastic um, and really exciting on the commercial side, but just seeing so much of that interest is on the residential side and that's where the bulk of the dollars went during the pilot. Um, like, should we... What did we learn from that um, going forward? So I would suggest that there's plenty of interest on the commercial side, um, but this artificial two-year window of a pilot 
did not line up well with commercial decision making and budget cycles. We had a number of commercial program um, uh, building owners come forward who will come back later. And a number of buildings with even grander um, plans than what the $1 million uh, currently would limit it to. Um, we'll do a better job of advance notification. We'll be recontacting them and we'll be working with those cycles of decision making and uh, budget approvals for outside companies in order that uh, they can start to use up more of this, this available funding. Okay, that's that's really fantastic to hear. So that sort of two limit or two year um, barrier, if you will, is no longer there. So we're okay, wonderful. Um, what is the risk of uh, increasing that that twenty to a higher number at this time? Get, and I'm just asking because I mean we amended our uh, debt fiscal management policy to specifically accommodate the clean energy improvement program. Um, it's pretty secure. Uh, thoughts on, on that? Yeah, Councilor Salvador, from a financial perspective, I would say there is no risk just because of what you said there. The debt management fiscal policy allows for this, so it doesn't impact our debt limits. Um, I would say it, it's kind of like what Barbara said, it depends on the demand. So we would, we would I think we want to get a good indication of that first and how, how fast this um, progresses before we kind of make that decision. Um, and also just the challenges right now around securing a, a permanent funding source for something like this. Councillor, I would also suggest that the main risk is reputational. If we're unable to secure t more than $20 million of financing, and yet that's what we've passed in the bylaw, um, then there is the question from the community as to why we're not delivering on the promises we've made. I'm out of time. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. So a few questions uh, on the, uh, so how, how can we support folks who wants to do retrofits but don't need financing? Uh, in terms of what other programming is yeah. available? Other than, yeah. Yes, so it's exactly it. Uh, SEEP is one tool, and yeah. it's a tool for certain people. It, it's not a tool for everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, if we look at the levers of change that we've outlined in the energy transition strategy, mm -hmm. part um, of what, one of those levers is education and awareness. For some people, it's making sure they have some good resources and information. Okay. Um, uh, moving up uh, along that that line is incentives to okay. encouraging people, um, whether it's financial or um, non-financial incentives, um, to to make that decision to do it now. I think okay. we're seeing um, through our perception survey, the majority of Edmontonians, I think it's 84% value uh, energy efficiency in their mm -hmm. home. But um, sometimes an incentive gives them the reason to act now Got or today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are two uh, additional levers. Got it, got it, okay. Uh, are there opportunities for kind of more collaboration among uh, the 15 Alberta municipalities that are participating in the uh, CEIP, CEIP program now to, uh, you know, maybe find efficiencies uh, in terms of education or capacity building or marketing? Are there opportunities for collaboration? Um, we have a, a pretty healthy network of uh, CEIP uh, sharing uh, yeah. across Alberta and across the country as well. So we've shared things like <coughs> templates and contract forms okay. and that sort of thing. Um, I think uh, the the one item where we can all benefit from is this coaching services pilot that Edmonton is doing for residential. And uh, just good news uh, for Alberta Eco Trust, we do not want to limit it to see if applicants. It will be open to others as well. We're just recruiting. Um, in, coincidentally, when we launch, see if it's approved. So yeah. the coaching services will. In other jurisdictions, it has proven to improve the applicant experience, help people go deeper, and make yeah. more informed decisions on the retrofitting yeah. of their The problems. reason I'm asking, obviously, not the, to improve coordination, but also, you know, $1.8 million startup cost seems pretty high, right? Uh, is it comparable to other municipalities? And that also ties, ties into my other question around the $1 million for Alberta municipalities, right? That seems a lot of money. If you have 15 municipalities participating through Alberta municipalities, if everybody's paying, our, our program might be bigger than some other municipalities, so proportionally they may be paying less. But this seems a lot of money for going to Alberta munis from all 15 municipalities. 
the, the costs are uh, comparable to other large programs. We do expect the Alberta municipalities' costs to be coming down as they become more mature and have a large organization. And the numbers we included are high estimates because we have not negotiated that master program agreement yet. So right. there's, there's little room in there, I think. Do we know how big other municipalities' programs will be, like ours, 20 million, uh, or others comparable? Calgary has 15 million, yeah. uh, residential only, and their costs are. So if there's 15, they'll probably be paying $750,000. So it seems, proportionally seems like, uh, you know, a lot of money being allocated to an entity to manage similar program for different 15 municipalities. Uh, our experience with external vendors for managing programs like this, they're actually, uh, they have some efficiencies, they're actually pretty well funded. So our experience with dealing with rebate vendors, for example, Alberta municipalities comes in uh, quite competitive in their cost profile. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, okay. I, uh, the, do we have a kind of target or aspiration around how much greenhouse gas emission reduction we are kind of Want to want to want to see through these uh, uh, through this particular program? Maybe I'll start off um, at the highest level. So we know um, our building stock represents about thirty-seven percent of our GHG emissions mm -hmm. in the community. Um, in terms of the impact of the SEEP program, um, we're expecting. Just pulling up the number here. Sorry. While you're doing that, I'm asking this question. I'm excited about this, so don't, don't take me wrong. I'm really excited. Council Salvador has mentioned. It seemed to me on the cost, uh, Kent, just seemed a little bit high on the on the startup and also the uh, one million for fees, right? So just wanted to flag that. It's not. I'm a, a, very excited about this. Sorry for, for the delay there. Um, we're expecting, um, and again, this is sort of our forecast yeah. here, um, that the direct results of this program um, will catalyze about three tons of savings in a single family home. So uh, on the commercial side, um, you see more significant reductions, 30 to 40% potentially uh, reduced on the commercial side. Okay. Got it, good. Thank you, Council Salvador. Yep, yeah, um, thank you. So I'm just gonna stick with stick with the scale of the, the twenty mil. Uh, so I hear the hear the rationale around this being a stepping stone. I guess I I see the pilot as being a stepping stone and I can understand not wanting to go further and then have expectations from Edmontonians that that might not come to fruition. But I guess I'm I'm struggling to see how uh, or what, what the limiting factor is for us that wouldn't wouldn't be able to take us farther. Like if, if we're 20 mil today and then, I don't know, in six months time, we realize, oh, well, clearly there's demand. We need to go higher. Like why not do that at the outset, I guess is what I'm saying. So, given that there is no financial risk. Yeah, I'm just going to speak a bit about the financials and, and why 20 million um, is a number we're more comfortable with right now over four years. So um, as, as we kind of said in the presentation, we still don't have a mechanism to fund this on a permanent basis moving forward. So we're going to be using working capital in the interim just to get this off the ground um, for 2024 and personally to 2025. But uh, beyond that, we're still looking for a permanent funding source to get this going. So um, we don't essentially have $20 million even right now to permanently fund this. Um, so we'd, we'd have to be careful there as well. Can you help me understand the working capital pool then? Yeah, for sure. So we are, so to get the, to get the permanent program started in 2024 and 2025, we're going to use some of our more liquid investment earnings, or investment funds, sorry. 
Um, so we're going to use that, um, and whatever rate we would have earned on those is what the was the rate that the property tax owners will be paying. So we're going to dip into that to get this program started. In the meantime, in the interim, we're going to be looking and we're going to be working with private institutions, and we're going to continue to advocate with the province to see if we're able to secure a permanent funding source, so, so, so someone we can actually borrow from. But those are ongoing discussions right now, and we haven't we haven't been able to do that so far. Okay, can you, can you shed some light on what some of those conversations with the banking institutions have been like? They're very, they're, they're very preliminary, um, exploratory conversations right now. Um, but they're, we're working with banks and we're talking about financing, so there's just some, it's different than how we would traditionally borrow. So working through some possible arrangements with the banks. And, and the biggest one is continue to advocate from the province to allow borrowing for this. Right. Okay. Um, I'll switch gears for a second. Uh, I asked some questions of our speakers about opportunities for new home construction as well. Um, can you tell me about some of the work that's happening there? Uh, Alberta Efficient, uh, Energy Efficiency Alberta has been awarded some funding through FCM and uh, City of Edmonton was a sponsor um, to help them uh, secure that award and it is about uh, PACE or CIP for new homes and is there a place there is a variation they expect to have that research done uh, Q3 of 2024 and we would bring it back if there are some opportunities for Edmonton. Okay that's exciting to hear and look forward to, to learning more in that realm. Um, if I guess I'm I'm looking for opportunities for a bit of like interim check-ins. Um, when would this be? When would this conversation be back in front of council if if no direction is given today? Uh, <clears throat> Councillor, so I, I'm assuming the question is after if assuming that this moves through this spring and there's a uh, public hearing and the bylaw yep. is passed and we we operationalize this program and so it's running uh, we would look to come back um, annually um, and but with that caveat that if something is is new or a decisions required much sooner than that annual reporting um, that we would come back and in that coming back we would look to create a new report annually for council for committee that would not just highlight this program, but all of our community programs and a status check on where they're at, do they have appropriate funding, what are the barriers and opportunities or constraints or successes coming out of those programs as well. So an annual um, community program report would be the intention. Um, if it was to commence this year, um, we could commit to still this year coming back with that report within 24, 2024. Okay. Um. Thank you for that. Thank you, Council Salvador. So, if the if the program was a thirty million dollar program over four years, would the startup cost be the same of one point eight million, or would that increase proportionally? I should clarify that that one million dollars a year is not. We don't write that check to Alberta municipalities. That is a mix of the value of City of Edmonton team resources and. Uh, admin, uh, Alberta municipalities as program administrators. So it is a mix of internal costs as well as external, if that's helpful. Okay, so, so explain that to me again. Like, So there's a CIP team at the City of Edmonton. Yeah. There's me and several others. We have law support, and we put a value on that. Okay. So that is part of the $1 million, is the value of us committed to and spending our, our time on this program. And so that million dollars is made up of both paying at, uh, program administration fees to Alberta municipalities and the cost of our internal resources. Yeah. So, but like, like, like your your Period. salaries and your benefits are covered Correct. through the corporation. Correct. But so you're just kind of say if you're spending ten five percent of your time of just picking picking a number, probably Correct. you're spending more. I don't know, right? So uh, then that that's that's kind of counted toward the million dollar? Correct, so 30% oh, of my time, 10% of the lawyer's time, yeah. okay. the value of that is part of the sum of the million dollars. Oh, I see, so it may not be actually real dollar, it's just the kind, contribution in kind. True right? value of the investment. The invest. got it. Additionally, okay. Mayor so he, um, the plan is that before we come forward with second and third reading of this bylaw, yeah. a term sheet for what we're agreeing to with Alberta municipalities will be attached to that report. So you will be able to see the full financial picture of where that money is going yeah. before actually passing the bylaw itself. Got it. Okay. Uh, and also, 
the startup costs? Would they be same for twenty million dollar program or a thirty million dollar program? They would. They would be fixed. Three hundred seven hundred and fifty thousand was for an IT investment, so that would that will service whatever scale of program. Okay. And it's the same size team designing designing the permanent programs. So. so then maybe to harm right like. You identified a risk, I understand that, right? It's a working capital. But if uh, we can do a larger fund with the same amount of fixed cost, right? Is there opportunity to increase that fund by a little bit more within still keeping within that uh, the risk, risk tolerance? So, Mayor, so here you're asking me, is there an opportunity to increase um, the use of the working capital? Yeah, like if yeah. can, is it possible to maybe maybe twenty five million dollars or thirty million dollars instead of twenty million dollars because then your fixed cost is the same for correct. Yeah, whether you do a ten million twenty million dollar fund or thirty million dollar fund. Right. So I'll speak towards f f the financing yeah. kind of strategy here. So um, our ultimate goal is to finance this through. Uh, an external lending source. Yeah. Um, in the interim, we can use our working capital to to finance it. We want to limit the use of that working capital. We don't want it to be funding the whole permanent program, and there's a lot of reasons around that. Um, so I would um, I would suggest not using okay. like minimizing the use of our working capital. Okay. So, but you so let me ask this way then. In the future, you if. Capital becomes available. You say you got your banks partnering, or you got federal government, provincial government partnering on this. You can scale it up with the same amount of fixed cost that you are investing in. Correct. Okay, got it. Good. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, that's about it. Huh? No, that's fine. We'll, we'll have an opportunity. Okay, uh, that concludes the questions to administration. Uh, uh, who would like to move? Uh, just hold on. Council Salvador, yeah. Move that executive committee recommend city council that bylaw 20678 be read a first time and that attachment three of the January 17th, 2024 urban planning and economy report UPE 02134 remain private pursuant to section 27 privileged information of the freedom of information and protection of privacy act. Okay. I just need to interrupt. I have put in the chat, uh, we have information and apologies. It's just in live information that attachment one, which is the draft bylaw needs to be replaced. And so if we could also just get a motion that the updated replacement attachment one be added. Uh, uh, yep, that an updated replacement attachment one be added to the January 17th, 2024 urban planning and economy report, UPE 02134. Is that what you need? Thank you very much. Great. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak? Just quickly, I you know thank you so much for this. This is uh, I know the 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 scale is not to the level the, of the expectation out in the uh, in the in the community as well, right? But this is a very important program uh, in our efforts to uh, empower Edmontonians to uh, and help them reduce uh, uh, the emissions that our buildings. Uh, Produce right, so this is one tool that they can use along with other tools that uh, that might be available. So I'm uh, I'm excited about that and I look forward to uh, further conversations uh, on on this and opportunities to uh, to scale up and uh, you know anything that we can do in your conversations uh, to leverage our uh, uh, influence, whatever we may have, right, and uh, let us know how we can help in advancing this work. Thank you so much for for the work you do. And with that, I'll go to Council Salvador to close. Yeah, uh, just, just to be brief, you know, echo echo the mayor's sentiment. I'm also very excited about this. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic opportunity. Uh, when I think about um, the 39% of, of uh, emissions that come from buildings here in Edmonton, um, this is an important way that we can start to make a real dent in that um, while aiding in, um, in affordability and livability when it comes to our building stock. Um, 
you know, I, I too uh, will be looking for, for opportunities to, to push this even farther and faster. Um, and I, I would hope that um, if, if those opportunities arise, um, administration can, can bring those forward to us and um, uh, advocacy opportunities as well for us to, to push as, um, as a council to move farther and faster. Uh, be very, very interested in seeing what we can do in that regard. Um, yeah, and can't wait to can't wait to see this out in action. Um, but of course, as it as it goes through the appropriate channels and up to council. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Council Salados. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, 7.2, we have about three minutes. Uh, does the administration have a presentation on 7.2? How, how long is it? Five minutes? Five, six? Okay, then we'll take a break here. Uh, we'll be back at 3.45.
from chamber. I know this thing that gave for, yeah, yeah, but we, so if we reserve this for social. Okay, we'd like to call this meeting back to order. And I'll go to oh, do a roll call of committee members and uh, other council colleagues. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Jans. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. And I will check. Good afternoon. Oh, Councillor Jans is there. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's see if other colleagues are joining us. Councillor Rutherford. We hear you, Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Okay, all right, over to administration for the presentation. Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor Sohi and members of executive committee. Uh, I am the branch, I'm Bartos Jiraki, the branch manager of real estate, and I'm here today with Levy Graywall from uh, the real estate team, who is our project lead for Edmonton Exhibition Lands. Uh, we're here today to present and recommend for approval the sale of two parcels of land within Ex Edmonton Exhibition Lands, and I'll pass the presentation over to Levy, and we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Bart. Uh, as a quick background, the redevelopment of the Exhibition Lands is guided by both the Exhibition Lands Planning Framework and Implementation Strategy documents, uh, which were approved by Council and Committee in the spring of 2021. These guiding documents set the roadmap for how the Exhibition Lands will be redeveloped, as well as the guiding principles and vision for the future of the neighborhood. While aligning with the City Plan and focusing on key pillars of energy transition, climate and, divers and diversity in housing options, the path to delivering on these goals relies on a partnership between the City and our private industry partners. While the city will do what's required to help facilitate development by removing any encumbrances to development and investing in upgraded neighborhood level roadways and services, private industry partners will deliver the build out of the community with a market driven focus, all while aligning with the vision and principles outlined in those guiding documents. Next slide, please. Since the approval of the planning framework and implementation strategy, as well as the Exhibition Lands Capital Profile, uh, administration has been busy managing, planning, and progressing activities on site in preparation for this first and future phases of development. The marketing and sale of the phase one development lands are what brings us to committee today. However, there are multiple streams of activity progressing currently, which will contribute to the community build out. Notably, uh, as of late December of this past year, administration had successfully overseen the demolition of over 250,000 square feet of barns, once used as part of the operation of the racetrack. Additionally, planning is underway to begin abatement and demolition of the Coliseum in 2025. Administration also continues to explore methods to develop the exhibition lands as a future net zero community, uh, both through materials and methods used in construction of the buildings, but also in the potential for alternative energy sources within the neighborhood itself. And following a hopeful approval for the sale of these phase one lands today, uh, administration will continue to push to begin construction on public realm and utility upgrades adjacent to the phase one lands in the southwest quadrant of the, quadrant of the site for late summer of this year. 
Next slide, please. Um, that brings us to the phase one land parcels themselves. Uh, in May 2023, Avis and Young listed the first two parcels of development land at the exhibition lands, accounting for approximately 20 acres for public sale. The listing included evaluation guidelines requiring all, requiring all submissions to align with the vision and goals of the exhibition lands planning framework and implementation strategy and a fair market value purchase price. Following administration's review of all submissions, proponents with satisfactory evaluations were selected for interviews, allowing for administration to ask targeted questions to ensure the proponent's vision and goals aligned with the city's expectations and vision and goals for the neighborhood. After the interviews, administration entered into exclusive negotiations with a single proponent, resulting in the recommendation today to approve the terms of land sale attached to this report. Phase one land use is designated as ground-oriented residential in the Edmonton Exhibition Lands Planning Framework, which allows for a diverse mix of residential uses, including mid to low-rise apartments, row housing, stacked row housing, and some compact, semi-detached, duplex, and single detached housing. Small-scale neighborhood commercial uses are also permitted. The buyer intends for all homes constructed in phase one to be built to current net zero ready standards with the ability for all homes to transition to net zero operational in the future. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, uh, following executive committee approval of the land sale and execution of the sale land agreements, of the sale agreements by administration and the buyer, the buyer will provide a development concept plan to administration for approval. The development concept plan will communicate general land use distribution, product and building types, open space allocations and design characteristics, general layout for multimodal transportation circulation, and approaches to achieving energy performance and sustainability goals. Administration will then apply for subdivision and rezoning of the phase one land parcels to satisfy the condition precedence of the sale. The rezoning applications will be heard at a future City Council public hearing meeting where City Council will be able to consider the proposed land change uses. Uh, land use changes, sorry. Work is also underway in the engineering and design for the redevelopment of the roadways, utilities, and public realm areas the city is responsible for delivering. Construction on this work is expected to begin this upcoming summer of 2024. Administration will also continue to keep stakeholders and the public updated regularly through our regular meeting and information sharing cycles, as well as through the exhibitionlands.ca website. Last slide, please. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Is this your first presentation, Levy, or have you been here before? Uh, I, I was here before. You have? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I don't Sorry remember. if it felt like the first time. Was <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, we'll go to the speakers now. Uh, all right. I will check if uh, Pam McKinnon, Coco... Joining us remotely. Are you there, Pam? Yes, I am. Good. Uh, hi, I'm just hold Pam on. McKinnon. Oh. Yeah, just hold on. Uh, Wendy Saway? Right. I'm here. Thank you. And I will also see if we have John Larkon joining us remotely. Yes, okay, I'm good. here. Good. So thank you so much for joining us. Each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, and you will be heard in a panel. And uh, after that, committee members and council members may have questions to you. And we will start with the speaker, Pam mckinnon Coco. Hi. Good afternoon, Mayor Sophie, members of council, and all those attending. Thank you for providing this opportunity to speak and thank you for all the work you do. I am fortunate to be one of the many gardeners at the urban farm. I have gardened in various urban spaces in Edmonton over the past 25 years. Presently, I am part of the urban farm community located in section 1A on the maps provided with the agenda. We noticed on the agenda and attachments, there's no mention of farms or gardens. I'd like to share a bit about us. The urban farm started out as an interim use of surplus land in 2014. Our garden joined in 2018. 
At that time, there were four groups gardening. In 2021, the urban farm expanded thanks to supports from various foundations and organizations. It now has over 300 people from 25 groups involved in the garden and covers two acres. The farm has become an important part of the urban scene through its programs, outreach, sustainability, education, and community on these lands. The building of the garden is not just its physical structures or the nurturing of the soil, but it's the building of trust and relationships with people from all ages and backgrounds. The urban farm fosters a community. Many of the community come from away or have been displaced. They have expressed how they have found a sense of home, healing and belonging there. To me, it doesn't make sense to move something that is working so well. I am happy that there is a study looking into urban farming as a pilot for other communities. And I appreciate the extension for us to garden till the end of 2024. I'm curious as to what will happen to the urban farm and the community of gardeners in 2025. I wonder how would an alternative site be ready for 2025? We would love to engage in future discussions regarding urban farms and gardens in Edmonton, as we recognize the growing need and positive impact urban farms and gardens have an impact on our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Next, we'll go to Wen Wendy Sove. That's right. Please go ahead. I think that I have a couple of slides. Okay. Uh, yes. There we go. Yep. Um, okay, so um, in anticipation of this meeting, I had a look at the documents, um, some of which were shared by the city. And we see an aerial view of the garden uh, with a little square around it that sort of designates uh, what it is, um, the, the land that's for sale. And I wanted to show you two of the gardeners that I am involved with. Um, and so this is Otis uh, sitting on his... Um, uh, pumpkin that he grew in the, at the urban farm and his brother Emerson who is in our greenhouse and I think that we I just wanted to make the point that we shouldn't forget when we're making decisions in real estate that's affecting these people so um, I uh, with Pam am one of the gardeners at the farm that started in um, six years ago and um, I just uh, an incredible place. It's a gem in our city. Um, it brings together people from all over the world. There are indigenous gardeners. There are people who visit there. Um, over the years, I think there have been thousands and thousands of people who have visited the garden and rolled, walked through it and rolled through it. And everybody um, seemed to really love the place. Um, at this point, we have not been informed of um, what the city might have uh, in plans for the future of this garden. Um, all we know is that the land is currently up for sale. And I guess we are hoping that we would be involved in future discussions uh, about what might happen with the garden and tell you just how much, how very much we have loved the garden and loved the community that it created. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Next, we will go to John Alarcon. Hi, thank you for uh, opening this space for me. I'm um, from the Colombian community, one of the many uh, people uh, from those different backgrounds and communities coming from Sincunia, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Somali, just to name some of them. I have met and enjoy um, having an uh, interaction with so many people in this process of building the community. Since 2014, my family and I, we decided to uh, start growing uh, plants, veggies, vegetables, and uh, we are really um, uh, great and uh, enjoy the the opportunity that we have to be uh, in this all this process. It has been, it's no, it has not been easy. Actually, we have some, um, some and uh, many uh, handles to uh, deal with, but uh, uh, we want 
to be included in this process. I mean, as a Wendy and Pam say before, um, and uh, we haven't been included in the process of uh, putting that the land on sale, and we want to be uh, included and participate in any other discussions about the farm uh, moving. Um, my son is or is now 16 years old. He grow uh, like a Otis, and sorry, apologize for not having um, material or presentation material. I didn't have time, and uh, just to give you an idea, most people know me by the name of Juan, my real name, Juan Carlos Alarcón. I uh, from Colombia, an immigrant like uh, many, many people here, and we have been affected by the move uh, that we now facing, and uh, we would like to stay. So personally, um, I don't agree with the idea of selling this piece of land because it's more like Pam say, it's not just the physical space, it's building a community, a multi-community. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll see if uh, committee members and council members have questions to you. Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much to our speakers for um, for being with us. Um, I know some of you have been waiting a while to, to, to speak, so uh, thank you for your patience as well. Um, yeah, maybe to... Uh, I'll start with Pam. Hi, Pam. Um, nice to see you. I guess, can you help me understand um, some of the engagement or con conversation that has happened to date? It sounds like it's been fairly fairly minimal um, and what you might uh, want that to look like going forward. Sorry, I was cut off, so I missed that part. Oh, I was just asking. Um, you know, it sounds like some of the, the consultation or engagement uh, to date about uh, relocation of the farm has been pretty minimal to date. I'm just wondering what you what you would like that to look like going forward. I would like, um, well, to be engaged with it, for one thing. Um, to me, the space is uh, the perfect space for what is happening there. And we already have infrastructure there. Um, the people know where it is. So I would be hard pressed to want to move. I, if we did have to move, I would like it if, if uh, the representatives from the actual garden were able to be involved in the decision making. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, and uh, I would I would ask the same of our just our other two speakers. Does that like, if there were representatives from the garden um, around the table uh, as it relates to those those conversations about the the relocation, um, does that seem like a workable path forward? Because I think, you know, as someone who who has spent time at the garden, um, it is such an incredible community asset. Um, not only a place for growing, but a place for bringing community together, as you've all outlined. Um, and and I think it would be a real loss to not have it uh, on the entirety of exhibition lands as a, as a very large site. Um, but yeah, to Wendy uh, and, and to John, if there were future opportunities for that dialogue, uh, would that be a good way forward? Um, it's Wendy. Yes, I, I think that's, that's something that we're asking for. Um, you know, we recognize that the city has to make um, these diff some of these difficult decisions. But um, I think that the, it, it is something that the city should continue to support. And I think that we're on the ground people who've been there. We've been there. We're growing there. We're, we're maintaining the soil. We're 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 speaking with children as they come uh, on tours and seniors. Um, so we've seen it um, at, through through all of these years that we've been involved, and I think that we have information that we should bring to the decisions that should be made about the garden in the future. Thank you so much for that. Um, John, do you have anything to add on that front? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I would like just to complement what Pam and Wendy say. 
And I agree totally that uh, building community is a process, it's not an event, it's not something that uh, is making just overnight or can be uh, made uh, overnight. And if we have uh, almost 10 years to build this huge, more than 300 people joining for doing the same goal, I think uh, in, in the process of uh, moving, we will lose many, and uh, we don't want that. I think we want to keep all and actually add more and more to our beautiful community. So that's what I just want to, to add. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Um, I'll have a few questions to administration along the same line and uh, potentially some wording uh, for a motion that can move us forward in a good way. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Wright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was quite disappointed that I didn't see any in engagement um, with, with the gardeners at all. Um, and I think it is a wonderful place to for community to gather. And um, I think there's... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think there's also just recently, just this past year, the like the the four traditional um, um, healing medicines of our of our of our indigenous ancestors has just sort of taken root. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, we do, we do have a small in, indigenous um, in this year um, that's been there over the last couple of years, but an important part. Okay, and it and it is also a, a place for I guess for for community to to gather and and connect with one another, from from I guess all all different, um, all all different places. Yes, I, I was just at an event that was with the Edmonton Heritage Council, maybe, and it was with the multicultural health brokers who were at the garden, and it has I don't know how many different um, backgrounds people came from, but they, many of them have a presence at the garden. And it, they spoke to how it brought them together where they would probably never interact with each other, but it's brought that community together too and been really positive. And, and learning about some of those, um, I guess, um, different plants and that from, from their home countries and, and, yeah. and I've heard, and it's also an opportunity for them to, to learn to speak English too, right? Very definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will wait to see what, um, oh, oh, and I guess Juan, I was going to ask you, how has that, how has this helped you, um, coming to Canada, coming to Edmonton, um, having this urban garden? Well, yeah, um, I've been here in Canada since 2005. I have been live and move across Canada, basically. And uh, when I moved to Edmonton, that was back in 2013, uh, I just went, uh, well, my wife, my, my, myself, my son, um, she, yeah, our family start to uh, see and uh, consider things that are, um, make us uh, happier and relax and maybe think of uh, the nice things in life. So and um, uh, growing vegetables was one of these. So and we start with an organization called a uh, non-for-profit organization, the Edmonton uh, Multicultural uh, Coalition Association, that they provide um, uh, through um, Funding by the government from from grants from the government, both um, provincial and federal, they got into um, the community leaks. So we got a space, we got a plot, we start building our plots and start growing vegetables. Then we will move from, um, uh, yeah. for example, the London Dairy Com Community League to another space in another community league in Eastwood. Eastwood uh, Community League, we um, met with other communities. For example, the Edmonton Mennonite um, um, Center for Newcomers at that time. That was uh, back in probably 2016, 2015, 2017, not sure about that. And, and then uh, when uh, we, 
um, make connections. We decide and we've been offered this opportunity to move into the uh, piece of land that um, today is um, the Edmonton Explore, uh, Explore Edmonton, uh, the urban park, the Northlands at that time. And then we met uh, Pam, Wendy, and all these great people, and then we grow there. So we just invite the communities and the other people that we met and we have met before. And then um, the, the, the farm and the community start growing and grow even more and more. And that's what uh, we are right now, more than 300 people, basically. And um, we've been uh, uh, um, lucky to and, and happy to meet all these people. So yeah, that's how we have. Thank, thank you very much. It, I think it is a, a great yeah. place, and I look forward to Councillor Salvador's motion. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Wright, and thank you so much all, to all three of you for joining us and uh, and your contributions to uh, to city building and and community building. It's it's a phenomenal place. Uh, uh, and uh, we will ask those questions to administration and uh, look forward to uh, Councillor Salvador's uh, motion as well, how engagement can be, uh, uh, you know, started uh, in the, on, on the next steps of this. Thank you so much for joining us. With that, we'll go to questions to administration. Councillor Salvador? Yep. Oh, sorry, Councillor Hamilton? Councillor Hamilton, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had one question, um, and uh, and I just want to say thank you to the speakers um, for attending today. But um, I just wanted to clarify with administration: does anything related to this land sale uh, impede the ability for Explore Edmonton to work out the issue with respect to exhibition space going forward? Hello, Councillor Hamilton. I would say it doesn't impede the ability for uh, Explore Edmonton to uh, look at the, the additional space that they require at the next exhibition lands, although we are still working with them in terms of uh, relocating some of the storage facilities that they have on site. And this has been an ongoing dialogue that we've had over the last number of years with them, uh, but we anticipate things are progressing based on our, our last conversations. Okay, um, that's great to hear. Uh, I'll now turn it over to uh, Councillor Salvador. Salvador, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so just following up on some of the lines of, of thought from our speakers, um, looking for some additional information around, uh, yeah, the, the urban farm, um, potential, you know, options that have been looked at for relocation, where, what that process looks like. Uh, also wondering where Explore Edmonton fits into this conversation. Yes, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll just start by uh, acknowledging the comments that were made by the speakers and apologizing for uh, a lack of communication that I think we could have handled a little bit better. Um, overall, though, uh, in terms of the urban farm, it is a the farm is managed and operated by Explore Edmonton, and so a lot of our communication thus far has been through Explore. Uh, in the background, we have been doing everything we can in terms of minimizing impact to the farm through even the sale negotiations. And so with respect to the farm itself, we, we know that that is going to be the second phase of the development that the buyer is looking to move ahead with. And so we don't anticipate that that will be happening within the first couple of years uh, by any means. Uh, but we also know that we, want it, we need to communicate this better. Um, in addition to that, I just want to point out that um, over the last number of months as well, we've been working internally to review different options for maintaining uh, an urban farm within exhibition lands. Uh, we definitely see that as actually a really wonderful benefit both to community members, those who use it, but then also to a whole neighborhood. Uh, so we have been exploring options to date. We are looking to be meeting with Explore Edmonton to discuss those options um, as they are managing uh, the space to get their feedback and we absolutely need to also work with the individuals that are farming within this location to understand what the impacts are to them too. Absolutely. Um, well, I appreciate the additional context. Um, and I'm just thinking of uh, some potential direction and a way forward. You know, would it, would it be helpful to um, provide some direction around engaging with representatives as well as farmers from 
the urban farm or to at least ensure that they are looped in to the conversations that are happening uh, between yourselves and Explore Edmonton. I think, you know, I want to I want to give our speakers and I'm sure many other um, folks at the farm uh, the surety that that they're looking for that um, they will be involved in that dialogue. Yep, I don't think that would impact us. Um, Overall, we, we had intended and we'll be doing more communication with both Explore Edmonton and the farmers. So if there is, or for the individuals that are farming the, uh, the plots that are there. So if there is a motion that's put forward uh, to help direct that and to make sure that everybody is included, um, that wouldn't impact us. Okay, that's really good to hear. Um, I will just try to clean up some of that wording and then uh, you can come back to me, Mr. Ray. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Wright. Thank you. Is there any way to condition the sale that that's that they're taken care of so the let me just think this one through so okay. right now um, the conditions for that specific parcel of land are quite a ways out uh, there there won't be a land transfer for at least the next couple of years as far as all the work that's still required there there needs to be rezoning there needs to be uh, a subdivision to create a large block shell parcel. Um, we we could look at adding a condition mm -hmm. on the city's end to ensure that yes. we've dealt with um, uh, that other accommodation re has relocation associated with the okay. yeah with the urban Do farm. Okay. It is our intent. Yeah. I would say like that's it's something we're we're budgeting for as well. Um, and we've been doing a number of work, maybe a little too behind the scenes in the sense of we need to communicate some of this out a little bit more, but there is a, uh, an intent to actually relocate um, and that to intent, ensure that this is a continued use that's happening here. Okay. Yeah, because that, that intent can change depending on before the staffing elected officials, right? They don't even um, execute the sale agreement for So maybe I'll, I'll wait to see what um, Councillor Salvador's motion is, okay. reads. And, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're, so you said you're not going to be executing the sales agreement for at least a couple of years on the second parcel, right? We would execute the sales agreement. Okay. However, we don't anticipate the sale agreement will close due to the number of conditions that are still outstanding that will actually uh, need to be completed. There's due diligence in a number of factors that will have to be completed in advance, okay. which means it won't transfer for uh, quite some time. And would... Uh, finding an alternative site for the urban farm, if that condition is part of the uh, the agreement, would that somehow, how would that help or hinder, like, or would make any difference? Like, what are your perspective on that? I think if we just had a motion directing administration to work with uh, both Explore Edmonton and um, individuals who are farming the urban farm, uh, to ensure that we look at all the different options associated with okay. relocating them. I, I believe that should suffice and doesn't necessarily need or warrant a uh, condition to be added to the sale agreement. Okay. And uh, are there plans to uh, integrate the a permanent urban farm into exhibition lands? Is that something you're exploring or aspiring to? So that is part of the conversation that we're having where um, we will be presenting different options to explore Edmonton around where the farm could be relocated to within exhibition lands. Okay. Uh, so yes, to sum it up, that is something that we we want to do, and but we have to do that in coordination with Explore Edmonton as they are the ones that manage uh, that program. Okay, right. Well, you know, there could be other models too. You know, it's not necessary that Explore Edmonton has to manage it. Community could manage it. You know, there are 300 people who have plots there now. They could probably be doing it cheaper, you know, and uh, or uh, made a co cooperative type of uh, uh, governance and management. Yeah, that's a possibility as well. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's something Explore is always looking into as well in terms of their own operations, but yeah. I would agree with you. Okay. I think I think we should explore that more of a community-based model uh, of running the uh, the urban farm. Um, okay, I have questions around uh, the business model of exhibition lands. Can those be asked in public? For example, is it uh, uh, 
how are we financing the entire development of the exhibition lands for the preliminary infrastructure? Is it through your retained earnings or? Yes, it's through land enterprise retained earnings. Okay. Yeah. And the and the business case is that as you you upfront the the cost of that infrastructure, but at the same time, if the sale opportunities come your way, to re you recoup some of that cost, right? That's correct. And in this case, Levy will probably be able to speak to this a little bit. Uh, the way that this is different than something such as Watchford is that the city's acting more in the facilitator role, and so we'll do the neighborhood level improvements. So essentially what that would mean is, for instance, this year we'll be doing the construction of, or reconstruction of 79th Street, mm -hmm. but we, seek the development partners that we're working with to actually do more of the specific site servicing within the larger parcels themselves. So they take on additional costs and additional risk, but they also benefit from uh, the sale of the individual yeah. units afterwards. Got it. And uh, is it, is more of cost recovery uh, for for the entire, uh, uh, um, entire lands or? Yeah, Mayor, so for, uh, I think I can say, um, Phase one uh, will be profitable for us. Um, some of the some of the items related to some of the larger scale demolitions, as you can imagine, yeah. the spectrum, um, the barns, the racetrack. Those those end up eating uh, into the budget um, quite a bit. But overall, uh, the overall pro forma is yeah, in and around the cost recovery model uh, with potential for. Uh, overall profitability, even including those larger scale demolitions. Got as well. it, got so. it. Do we know the estimated cost for the entire city's cost, like your land enterprise cost for? We do. Uh, is that a public figure or is that a in cam? I don't believe it's public at this time. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we'll wait for it. Maybe I'll just follow up. No, okay. All right. okay. All right. And the, and the sale price for these parcels also. In private. In right? private as well, yes. Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, that's, uh, those are the questions I had. Councillor uh, Salvador? Can I say more questions? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Great. Um, so, actually, before I make my motion, one, one quick question on uh, next steps. And uh, I appreciated the slide that outlines sort of the sequencing of events upon approval. Um, so just for clarity, uh, there will be future opportunities, um, particularly at the public uh, public meeting, public hearing, I assume, um, that is, to have dialogue about, like, more granular detail around this site. Because right now, you know, I'm, of course, getting questions. People want to know what, what exactly things are going to look like, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but that check-in point is coming Q3 2024. Is that the correct understanding? Yes, and if I can just elaborate really quickly yeah. on that. Um, yeah, part of the process that we're going through right now is to make sure that we have a buyer that's ready to move ahead with a lot of their due diligence. And so now over the next number of months, uh, they will be preparing a, a much more f final concept plan that shows what the product type will look like, what the specific parcels would be developed as. And so that will come to administration and that will also be shown through a public hearing uh, once a rezoning moves ahead. And I think we're anticipating that's gonna be coming either late summer or into the fall, depending on how quickly we can get that moving. But we do anticipate applying for that, I believe, by the end of this month as well, just to make sure that things are rolling and uh, not providing any barriers to development and getting more housing units built. Excellent. That is wonderful to hear. Um, okay, so now I will... So you'll be probably subsequent, right? Because we have two recommendations. Oh, so, yeah, clear, would that be subsequent, right? That's a good point. Because we have recommendations to... It, uh, it could be added as a point to the recommend. Okay, let's do that then. Let's, let's do that. Yeah, That'll so be number in, three, unless then. there's a desire to do it a different way. No, I th well, let's add it. to the recommendation. Yeah, so I can read the full recommendation yeah. with that third point added. Um, that the sale of the land on the terms and conditions as outlined in attachment one of attachment, attachment one and attachment two of the January 17th, 2024 financial and corporate services report FCS 02210 be approved and that the land purchase and sales agreement be in form and content acceptable to the city manager to that attachment one and attachment two of the January 17th, 2024 financial and corporate services report FCS uh, 02210 remain private pursuant to section 16, uh, 24 and 25 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and 
that administration engage with representatives and farmers from the Edmonton Urban Farm and Explore Edmonton on options for the relocation of the urban farm to support its retention at exhibition lands. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Constance Salvador. I have a couple of questions remaining on the, uh, uh, and excuse me, I, I'm thinking on the fly here because of uh, yesterday's discussion around uh, affordable housing and houselessness uh, motion. Uh, how, how are we incorporating affordable housing into uh, overall vision for the exhibition lands? That's a great question. Um, we've been working with our housing and homelessness team on this regularly as well. Uh, currently, we're uh, designating one of the uh, parcels of land that's next to a future transit station as the likely parcel that would be available for specific affordable housing development. Yeah. In addition to that, though, we have uh, another piece of land that the city will be will I guess take care of now as it's no longer under ECDC's management. And that's something we've been speaking with housing about as well to see if there's an opportunity to actually really advance that towards the housing development much sooner as mm -hmm. it's uh, it's on the other side of the tracks and it's it's pretty much ready to be moved on. Okay. And so our goal overall is to make sure that we reach the 16% target within exhibition lands itself. And even in the proposals that were shared with, uh, with the buyer in this case, they're looking to create affordable product <laughs> in the sense of the average income that a typical family would have to make sure that a family's not spending more than 30% of their income on housing. So they are striving to ensure that it's uh, an attainable and affordable type of product at the end of the day as well. Got it, got it. And the, the future LRT stations, are they, they're part of the plan, but are they part of the, uh, the uh, how are they being funded? Are they coming out of uh, retained earning cost or is this a separate, would have to be a separate profile because of the probably? They would be separate, so they're not included as part of the, the actual development of or the development work that we have associated with the project. Okay. And so right now, they're they're not funded uh, per se to move ahead. Are they at a design stage? Like what stage are they? Um, I think they, there's likely some preliminary work that's been done, but I would have to double check on that. To Very conceptual, okay. nothing definitive, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I, I would just want to share that maybe we, maybe we design them to be more functional than uh, uh, aesthetic, right? So We would need money for that, so. Yeah, of course. Uh, Okay, all right, thank you so much. That's all we, that's all I had. So uh, we have motion on the floor, anyone to speak? Uh, to close? Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, sorry, Councilor Hamilton to speak? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, administration, for your presentation and for the speakers. Um, I think this has been a really constructive discussion today. Um, and it's heartening to see that there's land sales going ahead on exhibition lands, one of my initial concerns. Um, actually, could, could we just pause my time because one of the speakers, oh, there, there we go, sorry. Um, uh, it's heartening to hear that um, uh, some development is going to proceed on the site as I think one of my ongoing concerns with um, the exhibition lands uh, uh, was that we just wouldn't see development there. And I think it's, it's um, you know, desperately needed and, and will support our goals on housing. Um, I just want uh, to, f uh, and I appreciate Councillor Salvador's addition um, with respect to the urban farm um, as having that green space and active green space or, or cultivated space, I think we've heard adds a lot of value to the community. I do want to flag um, that, you know, uh, I'm, I understand that this site has a long and storied history with respect to the uh, Edmonton exhibition and, and the various iterations thereof and has been a gathering space for Edmontonians um, and residents from surrounding communities for uh, well over a hundred years. Um, I'm, I, uh, it's helpful to hear that administration is working with Explore Edmonton, but I don't want us to lose sight that, um, that, you know, that, that space is important and that the ARP, um, there's challenges with the ARP that I hope will be uh, addressed um, as we move forward on development of the site. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm will be watching very closely 
um, to make sure that we're addressing the concerns um, that our, our partners at Explore Edmonton have um, with the, the sort of long-term challenges of the site. Um, with that, um, thank you to Councillor Salvador for your constructive um, putting together a constructive motion, and I'm happy to support. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much, um, and really appreciate Councillor Hamilton's uh, thoughts as well, and, and the dialogue that we all had today. Um, thank you again to our speakers uh, for for your contributions, um, and and also for all the work you do at the urban farm. It it truly is um, a gem, not only in in the surrounding communities but uh, in the city. Um, it's a special place where folks can can come together, and um, like I said earlier, it's not just about cultivating food and um, and also agriculture, uh, but but community as well. Um, and to see the diversity of community groups that are represented at the urban farm, um, it's really quite inspiring. Um, so thank you for your work. Uh, this is a real milestone moment for exhibition lands, um, to see the first land sale uh, moving forward. You know, I it's not often that you get a site of, of this size and scale um, in a central core neighborhood uh, that has the potential to be a, a truly uh, transit-oriented community uh, that is connected to fantastic assets like the like the River Valley, um, like transit, amazing businesses that, that surround the site as well, um, and an opportunity to provide a diversity of housing typologies that uh, don't, don't exist currently in the surrounding communities. Um, I know a lot of Edmontonians have been looking at this site for a really long time um, and they've been eagerly awaiting some, some movement and some progress. Uh, it's been really exciting to see visibly um, some of the demolitions that have been taking place uh, as a real marker of that progress and of that, that forward momentum. Um, so really looking forward uh, to, to the next steps as we, as we advance this along. Um, like I said before, uh, this is an opportunity to really, really carry forward the vision that is set out in the city plan um, and create a complete community. Uh, I did just want to touch on, uh, as Councillor um, Hamilton mentioned, you know, future opportunities to uh, have discussions with Explore Edmonton about um, the retention of uses on on site that would support their their continued success. I think that's an important conversation uh, going forward as well. Um, so looking looking forward to all of this. And and again, thank you to administration for your excellent work. Uh, I would encourage everyone to support this. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, just trying to, uh, I want to figure out whether we'll be able to finish the uh, agenda in half an hour. Uh, uh, just want to get a sense, uh, you have how, how many uh, the, around questions from you on those in-camera meetings? Or, or maybe we can go in-camera then decide that because uh, a clerk is fine extending the order of the day for uh, maybe half an hour. Uh, just if, if we need to, or, uh, sorry. If I may, just yeah. so that we don't have to um, use additional agenda time to come back into public and then go back into private. If you if you think that you're just going to require maybe a few extra minutes past five, um, even that, if you want to just extend orders to finish the agenda now, otherwise you'd have to come back into public. Okay, I don't, I don't think we'll go beyond uh, uh, five, but just to be on the safe side, maybe just uh, we, we can move that, extend the order to finish the agenda. Okay, Councilor Salvador, can you? Yeah, I'll move that? Uh, that we uh, move to extend to finish the agenda. Okay, please vote. I'm a yes. I just lost power on my computer. Thank you, Councilor Wright. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, can someone move that we go in camera? 
I move subject to sections 24, 27, 16, 25 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I think I got them all. Please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
we are in public. Okay, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I would like to move um, that the instructions as outlined in attachment one of the January 17th, 2024 integrated infrastructure services report IIS 02237 be approved and that the January 17th, 2024 integrated infrastructure services report IIS 02237 remain private pursuant to sections 24 and 27 of the FOIC Act. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I would like to move that the City of Edmonton claim be resolved as recommended in the January 17th, 2024 Employee and Legal Services Report, ELS 02238, and that the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the city manager and that the January 17th, 2024 employee and legal services report ELS 02238 remain private pursuant to section 16, 24 and 25 of the FOIC Act. Oh, and I think 27 as well. Thank you. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'd like to move that the instructions as outlined in item, or sorry, attachment one of the January 17th, 2024 Employee and Legal Services Report ELS 02252 be approved, and that the increase in the confidential non-competitive procurement as outlined in attachment two of the January 17th, 2024 Employee and Legal Services Report ELS 02252 be approved and that the January 17th, 2024 Employee and Legal Services Report ELS 02252 remain private pursuant to Section 16, 25, and 27 of the FOIP Act. Council Wright, just to clarify, point two that you raised, we've been advised is no longer required if point one is uh, passed. So we have the updated motion on the board for you. Okay, sorry, then we will delete that one and call 3-2. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now. Mayor, motion. I'd like to do a yeah, subsequent. subsequent, right? So please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move that administration prepare a memo to council uh, identifying the active legal claims being advanced against the city Whoops. Uh, with an estimated liability of over $1 million and identify active legal claims being advanced by the city with an estimated recovery of over a million dollars and explain the corporation's rationale for self-insuring against liability. Sorry, I just have to enlarge it. <laughs> I think the clerk's advice was to not include the part two. Yeah, so I've got the ABC, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Correct. yeah, that's it. But that's it, yeah. okay, okay. All right, okay. Mm, can and you make the introduction, please? Just to introduce it, um, I just sort of wanted a little more holistic view of, of any outstanding liabilities that we might have that could impact um, impact budgets going forward and just to get a better understanding of our ability to, to self-insure against these liabilities. All right, any questions, colleagues? Seeing none. You want to close on it? Or anyone to speak? Seeing none, you want to close on this, Councillor Wright? I'm done. All right, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Motion spending none. Notice of motions or motions without customary notice. Seeing none, we are adjourned at 516.
Thank you, everyone. Clerk's team, administration. This was a long day, but. We